Imagine selling an imaginary airport for $242 million. How can one even begin to imagine something like this? Many of us receive spam emails frequently, and Nigeria in particular is famous for this type of scam. You receive an email from a person who claims to be a prince, a doctor, or a bank manager, and he tells you that there is a large amount of money, and he needs your help in transferring this amount to the country. In return, you will take a large part of this amount, but all you need to do is to send a small amount in advance in order to verify your bank account before they start transferring millions of dollars to you. One of the classic scam methods from when humans started using email, but the scam that we will see today was before the internet era. Originally, these internet scammers are just rookies in front of the Nigerian king of swindlers, who we will see in today's story about how he sold a fake airport for $242 million. In 1995, the manager of the Brazilian Moro Este Bank received a call from Nigeria. The caller on the other end was not an ordinary Nigerian citizen. This caller was the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. The Central Bank is the highest financial organization in the country, and it is the one that controls all the banks in the country and determines the financial policies. The governor of the Central Bank is considered to have the rank of a minister, meaning the director of the Noro Este Bank, thinking it was very serious that the governor of the central bank of a country called you. The topic is definitely important. The governor of the central bank of Nigeria started to speak and said that Nigeria is planning to build an airport in the capital city, Abuja. Abuja is one of the largest cities in Nigeria, and the number of people in it is very large. Certainly, if an airport is built in it, there will be a large movement on it. Here, the interest of the director of the Brazilian bank increased, and he began to listen more carefully. The governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria continued his speech. He said Nigeria is currently looking for investors to invest in the airport project, and the estimated cost is about $250 million. All of this is available to you, and we are presenting this opportunity to more than one bank around the world. I mean, it was as if he was saying that you need to hurry. If you do not seize the opportunity quickly, another bank may come and take it. The Brazilian bank manager was thinking of airports in large cities around the world as one of the most lucrative projects. An average size airport can return the initial investment, which is $250 million. Within a year or two, this means that this chance might be an irreplaceable opportunity. So the director of the Brazilian bank came to think a little while he was holding the phone. But the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria cut the rope of thoughts when he said, and also we will give you, as a bank manager, a special offer. You will have a commission of $10 million. Since you are the mediator who will allow this deal to take place, the manager of the Brazilian bank felt an increase in enthusiasm. He already thinks that this is a distinguished investment opportunity for the bank. But after he heard, he will take $10 million on top of it. This deal started to look even more attractive. In the end, he is not investing his money. He is investing the money of the bank's customers, the people who deposited their money in the bank, and the thing made him care less. In the end, after some back and forth, he took a bid with the governor of the Nigerian bank. He said, okay, our bank is going to take this investment opportunity and started with the procedures the director of the Brazilian bank did not know. He was not talking to the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, but he was talking to a person named Emmanuel Nodi. Emmanuel did not have any business in building an airport. In fact, there was no airport in the first place. The whole situation is a lie. So who is this person and how was he destined to pull this huge scam? Emmanuel Nodi was also the director of a bank in Nigeria, a bank called the Union Bank of Nigeria which is a private commercial bank. It was not even a state bank, and Emmanuel was a comfortable man who had reasonable money and wealth. He had ambitions, he wanted more, he wanted millions. He started thinking about how he could get such a fortune. Hence, this crazy idea arose in his head, the idea of looking for investments to build an airport in the Nigerian capital. Although he was a bank manager and had a strong reputation, 
Even though this reputation was not sufficient for a great scam like this, he needed a stronger and greater reputation. So he decided to impersonate the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. His name was Paul Akuma. But the plan must be prepared strongly and accurately. He gathered a team of five people from the people close to him, and whom he knew and began with them, to discuss the details of the plan to attract one of the banks to invest in the fictitious airport project. This group, which was formed by Emmanuel Nodi, were all experienced in financial and banking systems, and they were working in the banking sector like Emmanuel. So they knew all the details of banks and how they operate in Nigeria and internationally. And they had personal and private information about the most important influential people in the financial sector in the country. And this thing made it easier for them to impersonate the identities of important people. The first thing in the plan was that they would send faxes to various commercial banks around the world. They prepared a letter written in an official and professional manner, on the basis that this letter was sent by a person named Turithia William. This person was the director of the Financial Planning and Budgeting Department in the Nigerian Ministry of Aviation, meaning a very important person, but this person did not exist at all. The important thing in this letter was that the Nigerian Ministry of Aviation is looking for investments to build a large airport project in the capital Abuja, since Abuja was declared the new capital of Nigeria only four years ago in the year 1991. And this is what made this story or scam more believable because the Nigerian government, they were really serious about developing the city and running multiple projects in it since they declared it the new capital of the nation. This message was sent to several foreign banks and each message was slightly changed according to the bank and the country of destination. For example, the message that arrived at the Brazilian bank Noroeste was addressed to the bank manager, this bank manager, named Nelson Sakaguchi. He is of Japanese roots, but he was living and working in Brazil when Nelson Sakaguchi read the message. It was an official letter coming from the Nigerian Ministry of Aviation and signed by the director of the financial department. He began to take an interest in the matter because the bank was already looking for investment opportunities in developing foreign countries, which boosted the credibility of this letter after it was transmitted from a number belonging to the Nigerian government. Indeed, Emmanuel and his group, thanks to their contacts and strong relations in the financial sector in Nigeria, were able to use a fax machine that belongs to the government so that the case would look more believable. Saka, a director of the Brazilian bank believed the letter and responded to the facts with a message that they were interested in this investment opportunity and wanted to discuss it more. Here comes the role of Emmanuel. He impersonated the governor of the central bank and called Sakaguchi, and they began to talk and delve into the topic more. During this call, Sakaguchi is almost convinced of this investment and is ready to join them now. The next step was that they need to set up a meeting. Sakaguchi asked Emmanuel and said, let's meet either in Nigeria or you come to Brazil. Emmanuel said, no, we would like to keep the project confidential now because this project will not start until four or five years from now. So we don't want to announce the project before we start executing it. How about we meet in a place far from Nigeria and Brazil? Saka said, I have a job in London next week. What do you think of our meeting there? Emmanuel answered with approval, and they agreed that they would meet in London after about a week. Emmanuel and his team wanted to prepare for this meeting. The important thing is that each one of them impersonated an important person, Emmanuel, of course, as the governor of the central bank. A second of them impersonated the deputy governor, and the third took the position of director in the Ministry of Aviation, so each one of them took a position since they were five, in addition to the wife of one of them. They prepared themselves very well. They also prepared a plan for the airport and a site and the land on which they were going to build the airport. Then they flew to London and stayed in a luxurious five-star hotel. And when Sakaguchi arrived at the airport, they sent him a limousine to welcome him. And they booked him the best suite in the hotel. And after that, during the meeting, they introduced themselves as the characters they played, and Sokka was believing everything. Of course, at that time, 
There was no internet, Google, or search engines, meaning Saka was not able to enter the internet and search for the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria's pictures to confirm his identity. And on top of this, Emmanuel has fake documents that look very real, also has pictures with the president of Nigeria and the prime minister, which makes the lie look more realistic. He narrated the initial airport plans, the business plan, and the location of the land, which was all a lie. But during their meeting, Emmanuel said, we want to keep the project confidential. This project will not start construction until four or five years from now. Saka told him, we will send the money anytime you all would like to start the project. Emmanuel interrupted, saying, no, we cannot wait until the time of construction. The money must be in our hands sooner because all that we have is just plans. We need to start hiring companies and providing tools and materials. So the supply of money must start from now. Here Saka started to second guess himself. It was clear to Saka that there was something suspicious with Emmanuel, who pressured him and said, look, if you are not comfortable with this project, then there is no problem. We had a large number of investors who would like to meet with us to discuss this opportunity, but you were the first one to respond to us. And you were excited about the idea, and also like what I told you before on the phone. We would like to reward you with a commission of $10 million for your efforts to complete the deal. But if you are not comfortable, we can look for other investors. He was afraid to lose such an opportunity great investment plus a commission of $10 million. Saka told Emmanuel, even if I agreed with the case, the bank's management probably would not accept it. Emmanuel replied to him and told him this issue must be resolved by him. And as I told you, if your bank is not ready to take this opportunity, many others are waiting for it. Then Saka said, no, you can count on me. We are partners in the project. I will manage things. From this moment, Emmanuel knew that Sakaguchi had fallen into the trap and that the 10 million he had promised had motivated him. It would let him do anything to complete this deal. Saka believed that he was talking to some important people from Nigeria. The agreement that was made between them in London is that the bank will invest an amount of approximately $242 million, and we are talking about the year 1995. I mean, this money today is worth about $413 million, a huge amount. And before they finished their meeting in London, Emmanuel persuaded Sakaguchi to transfer $3 million as a deposit and proof confirming their desire for this investment opportunity. Saka felt the pressure and had to pay this down payment to not lose it, and there he fell into the trap, even if he begins to suspect that the fraud is on him after the first payment. He will still pay more to remain hopeful. Sakaguchi got played psychologically, and this is the most important skill for any professional scammer. So Emmanuel insists that Sakaguchi pays a deposit of three million before leaving London. He became completely under Emmanuel's mercy. Saka keeps sending Emmanuel millions constantly over three years. From the year 1995 to the year 1998, Saka the idiot didn't tell anyone from the bank's management and even took some effective steps so that no one from the management and the main owners of the bank knew about it. The most important step is that he did not transfer an amount greater than $6 million in each transfer, but why did he change it in this way? Saka was responsible for all transfers to foreign countries worth less than $6 million. If he wanted to transfer a larger amount, he had to take board approval. The second step was that these transfers should not be transferred to one account or one country. It needs to be transferred to different countries, for example, America, Britain, Switzerland, and Hong Kong. Even the banks to which the transfer was made were different, as these transfers were transmitted between a network of different countries and banks. No one from the bank management team was paying any attention to where is this money going because following up on the money was supposed to be the bank manager's job. As for Emmanuel and his team in Nigeria, they used 17 banks to mix up this money and distribute it in a way that doesn't raise suspicions. This way, Saka transferred $242 million to Emmanuel and his crew within three years. During this period, 
Emmanuel was sending false documents, pictures, and contracts to convince him that the work on the airport project was still underway in preparation for the start of the real construction process. As I told you, Emmanuel and his crew all come from a banking background. When they took this money, they invested it. They bought real estate in Nigeria and also in different regions around the world. And they bought shares in several companies. The topic remained hidden from everyone, and it was most likely that it would not be revealed for a long time. If something unexpected had not happened, the thing was that a big bank named Santander Bank, the largest bank in Spain, wanted to acquire Noro Este Bank. So they made an offer to Noro Este Bank, and the bank's management expressed their initial approval. Of course, an acquisition approach like this is a very huge process, and before this procedure takes place, it must take a review of all the assets and documents so they can evaluate the value. So a board was formed from the two banks, the Spanish bank and the Brazilian bank, so that this board studies all the details that they need to assess the value of the bank. To their surprise, they found that about a third of Noro Asti Citibank's capital missing, which is about hundreds of millions. The bank's manager, Nelson Sakaguchi, was summoned by the board of directors to explain to them what happened in the past three years. He admitted that he concluded a huge investment deal with the Nigerian government to build an airport in the capital city Abuja, and that he transferred the amount of $242 million over the past three years without the knowledge of the board of directors. But the bank did not believe what they were hearing. He managed this bank faithfully for the past 14 years and then made such a huge decision without even telling them and in a very suspicious way. A committee of investigation was formed after a long effort of tracking the complex network in which the bank's money was transferred by tracking this money in several countries and several banks. All roads, in the end, led to Nigeria. The problem is that Nigeria does not have real financial control. The committee was not able to reach the true identity of the people who received the money in Nigeria. The issue took a long time until Nigerian banks were forced by pressure from Western banks, mainly Swiss banks. After they investigated the case, they stopped several accounts which the money was transferred through. They precisely asked Nigerian banks to cooperate with them in revealing the true identities of the owners of these accounts and Nigerian banks for fear of blocking their accounts in Swiss banks and other countries. They decided to cooperate with them. Indeed, in the end, they came to the identity of Emmanuel and the crew, and they faced another problem. Nigeria was not a country that had laws against financial fraud. Emmanuel and his group remained free in Nigeria, and they may have bribed several officials so that they do not care about any Western claims to arrest them or investigate their case. The Brazilian bank Noro Este sold to the Spanish Santander Bank and the purchase deal was completed, but this deal was worth much less than the actual value. Sakaguchi's trial was held in Switzerland on charges of financial fraud and money laundering, and he was sentenced to prison for several years. The owners of the bank were not silent about their right and appointed lawyers in different countries to try to recover some of what they lost from this huge fraud. But the problem is that most of the money and property was in Nigeria, and the Nigerian government is impossible to cooperate with them. And the issue remained like this until John Ovasanjo, the new president, came to Nigeria. This president and his government noticed the escalation of financial fraud cases in Nigeria. The president decided to form a body called the Financial Crimes Commission. This body was formed in the year 2003 and the year 2004. The commission opened an investigation into the case of Emmanuel and his gang, and against the background of this investigation, five of them were arrested, but as I told you, they were six. The sixth died in a car accident during the investigation period, and many even expect that this was not in fact an accident but an assassination, and the reason is that Emmanuel had suspicions that this person was intending to speak, exposing everything in exchange for a lenient sentence. Emmanuel decided to get rid of him, but this is all a theory. The important thing is that Emmanuel and the remaining four were arrested and their trial began in the city of Abuja. During the trial, Emmanuel appointed a large number of jurors 
and the judge of the court reached the point that in the trial session, he warned Emmanuel against trying to bribe officials and members of the jury. The judge did not know who took the bribe and who's not. So after the judge saw that things had slipped from his hands, he decided to stop the case and transfer it to the city of Lagos, the largest city in Nigeria. Even after the trial turned to the city of Lagos, Emmanuel kept trying to bribe the officers. He tried to reach the head of the Financial Crimes Commission, but this bribery attempt did not succeed. An attempted bribery charge was added to his indictment, but Emmanuel's attempts did not stop. In the middle of the trial, a warning arrived that there was a bomb in the courtroom and it would explode at any moment. So the hall was evacuated quickly and the session was stopped and postponed for several hours until the special forces came and examined the place. But they discovered that there wasn't a bomb and the threat was fake. In the end, Emmanuel did not benefit of this move and it has not been proven that he was the one behind it. It was a plan to escape and failed. The important thing is that during the trial they tried to negotiate with Emmanuel to return the money he stole in return for giving him a reduced sentence. He said he was ready to return $10 million. They said, no, we will not accept less than $80 million. Emmanuel came back and said to them, I will not return more than $40 million. This is all I have. The important thing is that the public prosecutor told him, look, this is your last chance. If you don't accept that you return the sum of at least $80 million, you will lose the reduced sentence. Then the court brought an unexpected witness. This witness was Nelson Sakaguchi, former director of the Brazilian Noro Este Bank and the person who was primarily responsible for the loss of all this money. Sakaguchi entered the courtroom full of embarrassment when Emmanuel saw him. He knew that he had fallen into trouble and that this case had taken a completely new turn. Sakaguchi confessed to everything, that Emmanuel impersonated the governor of the central bank, which is a major crime, and he said that they financed him $242 million. He showed many pictures, documents, and messages that were between them, and that supported his claims. After this testimony, the accusation became more proven against him, and here Emmanuel tried to return to the previous offer, 80 million. But the public prosecutor said, no, now you must return at least $120 million of the money to their owners, and also a fine of more than $10 million that goes to the Nigerian government. And because Emmanuel had no other option, he agreed. And in return for this deal, he was sentenced to five years, but he didn't spend these five years he stayed in prison for less than two years, and he put cases on the government, claiming they took more property from him than the agreement, which is $120 million. He was able to win these cases and recover about $50 million in properties. All of this was through bribes that could have reached millions of dollars. After these events, Emmanuel Nodi remained free for many years. He continued to live a life of prosperity and without problems, but he was arrested again in the year 2016. But this time it was not a scam case, but it was a murder case. It seems that he was in a dispute over lands in one of his regions, and Emmanuel sent about 200 of his followers to attack these lands and their owners and battle them. This led to the death of a guard and some serious injuries to several policemen. Consequently, Emmanuel was arrested in the year 2016 on charges of conspiracy to commit murder. But if we know something from his history, I don't think he would take a long sentence, and it is most likely that he is now living his life comfortably in his luxury and extravagance palaces among his men. And here we reach the end of our story. Do not forget to like and subscribe to the channel and activate the bell button. Make sure you take a look at other stories in the channel. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next video.